Number five, Yang Yongjin. Yang Yongjin is a controversial Chinese clinical psychiatrist, infamous for his practice of trying to treat internet addiction. Well, that almost sounds noble. Now, I definitely spend too much time on Twitter for my own good. What's so evil about getting people to spend more time in the real world? Well, it could be because of his methods, you know? Yang is a firm believer in electroconvulsive therapy, and if you're not familiar with that term, it's a fancy process in which surges of electricity are ran through a patient, inducing a small seizure to treat mental illness. So the way to treat people who are spending too much time on electronic devices is to hook them up to something electronic and let electricity run through their body painfully. Yeah, okay, no, I'm starting to understand where some of this controversy is coming from. Yang believes that people suffering from internet and gaming addiction suffer from personality disorders and need to be treated as such. His clinic doesn't really run like a regular clinic, but has been more closely described as a boot camp. Parents sign away their children into Yang's foster care, who then get sent to a prison-like environment of harsh treatments and cruel conditions. Yang would treat his patients in a military-like manner, punishing them with more treatments for misbehavior, or rewarding patients who would act as informants against other patients. In addition to round-the-clock shockings, Yang would also administer medications to his patients without the consent of them or their parents by sneaking them in as diet supplements. Yang would punish patients who tried to get their parents to take them home with, well, you can probably take a guess, more shocks. Yang's practice has since been shut down, but in the time it operated, it's estimated that as many as 6,000 patients were exposed to cruel treatments by the doctor. Yang's controversial methods caught him international attention, even in pop culture. The popular multiplayer video game Dead by Daylight, in which players play a monster attacking a team of players trying to survive, featured a character actually inspired by Yang. In 2017, the development studio held a poll for Chinese players to, on suggestions for a Chinese monster, since the game was very big. There. And Yang was a popular write-in vote, as obviously Chinese gamers would see him as a monster, leading the team to create a character who was a doctor who used electricity to shock his opponents. Releasing with him as well was a survivor named Feng Min, an esports pro serving as the doctor's nemesis, an internet-addicted patient, and a map set in a Chinese asylum to boot. Before the final release of the character, though, the doctor was changed to an American backstory, presumably to avoid any possible pushback or controversy of comparison to the real doctor. But it's probably saying something if your audience considers you a monster on the level of Michael Myers and Freddy. Next up at number four, Dr. Sigmund Rascher. Known for his cruel contributions to the German army in World War II, Sigmund Rascher is among one of the worst scientists in human history. Sigmund's father was also a physician and an avid follower of Rudolf Steiner, an occultist and self-proclaimed clairvoyant. So naturally, Sigmund attended the first Waldorf school based on Rudolf Steiner's philosophies. He went on to study medicine in Munich and later worked for an internship in Switzerland with his father. But despite his upbringing, it seems he grew to align with some other ideologies, eventually joining the German paramilitary organization. And that is where his evil doings would begin. He denounced his father and soon became acquainted with the leader, asking for human subjects to be placed at his disposal. He made it clear the experiments could prove fatal, but that it would be required for accurate results. By 1942, he began conducting experiments in pressure chambers, where he would simulate a high high altitude and then quickly alter the pressure to simulate the conditions of a pilot free falling with no oxygen. Allegedly, the leader mentioned that those who survived could be pardoned death at the camp, but Sigmund talked him out of it, stating that they didn't deserve any amnesty. Further, he conducted cruel freezing experiments on 300 prisoners, allegedly to figure out the best way to warm up soldiers who experienced hypothermia. He would either force his victims to remain outdoors completely naked in freezing temperatures for up to 14 hours or would place them in tanks of ice water for three hours, measuring their pulse and internal temperatures all the while. From there, they would try to warm up the victims, usually with water, but experimented using a variety of different temperatures, including boiling, and this would often cause further harm. Along with his other forms of torture under the guise of science, Sigmund would administer polygal, a substance to aid blood clotting, and then shoot or amputate a limb on his victim to see the speed at which they would bleed out. But I will let you know he eventually did get what was coming to him after years of falsified
falsified facts from botched experiments, as well as killing his own lab assistant, Sigmund was executed under the order of the leader, and in 1990, his experiments were ruled inhumane and criminal on top of containing falsified data. Number three. Albert Krigman. Right off the top, I just feel like this guy's got an evil scientist name. Krigman just, I don't know, hits the ear wrong. Well, he was guilty of a lot more than a scary sounding name. Dr. Krigman was a dermatologist who was contracted by Dow Corning, Johnson & Johnson, and the US Army to research the effects of chemical compounds on human skin. Being offered a modest 10 grand in grant money, Krigman set out to work right away finding a bevy of inmates of Philadelphia's Holmesburg prison, where he would experiment on thousands of inmates with little to no regard for the prisoner's safety or long-term health. It was documented that the experiments at Holmesburg prison entailed a delightful assortment of things like hair transplants, implantation of foreign bodies, burns and radiation of the skin, exposure to dioxin, application and ingestion of toxic materials and near lethal doses of acne medicine, and the yanking of fingernails to round it off. Delightful. One of the chemicals Krigman exposed his test subject to that I mentioned earlier, dioxin, was the main contaminant in Agent Orange the controversial chemical agent used in the Vietnam War by the Americans. Krigman was being paid to research the effects of dioxin on skin, and suffice it to say, it is not pleasant remotely. I hope there's a picture of something disgusting behind me. Inmates would be scarred, left sick, with permanently disfigured skin conditions leading to painful long-term side effects. Oftentimes as well, many subjects were exposed to all sorts of contaminants and other infections from the unsafe conditions of his experiments. Most of his inmates were brown by financial compensation, ranging anywhere from $30 to $50 for smaller experiments or $800 for some of the more extreme cases. This small bit of cash was really appealing enough to attract a constant supply of victims, prisoners, who had very little in the way of funds. This allowed them to get a little bit of freedom, a little bit of power within the prison, but also let them have a bit of hope that maybe they'd one day pay off their bail. Krigman destroyed many of the notes from his research, but through testaments from his victims, we know the truth of what he got up to. While there have been many attempts to get justice after the fact for what the inmates experienced, Krigman himself lived to the ripe old age of 93 and never faced any sort of consequences for his actions whatsoever. In fact, he was thrilled by the opportunity. Listen to this quote from Krigman describing how he felt setting up shop at the prison. All I saw before me were acres of skin. It was like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. That, that sounds made up. That sounds like horror movie bad guy dialogue. That sounds like something Jigsaw would say. But no, it was a real guy who was allowed to experiment on a lot of real people. Next up is Shiro Shi a notorious microbiologist and surgeon during the War of Resistance, a conflict between China and Japan in the 30s and 40s, Shiro Ishii led the development and application of biological warfare for the infamous Unit 731, and is truly an evil scientist if I've ever heard of one. Prior to his evil experiments, he was actually known as a pretty brilliant man. He had a photogenic memory and studied medicine at the Kyoto Imperial University. But despite his high credible grades, he was not known to get along well with his classmates. During his studies, he was known to grow bacteria in petri dishes and refer to them as his pets, a practice that made many uncomfortable as they felt he was treating the bacteria as more of a companion than a research subject. Potentially the first red flag in what would become a sea of evil and horrendous experiments. By 1927, Ashi was advocating for the creation of a bioweapons program, something that was a against the Geneva Convention at the time, but did not yet have enough power within his unit to make it happen. But in 1936, he was promoted to senior army surgeon and given full control over Unit 731, a decision I can only assume is regretted to this day. In these facilities, with no one to tell him no, Ishii decided to unleash his evil experiments on live humans, as he believed he could not get the results he was looking for by testing on animals. Ishii was notorious for injecting his subjects with deadly diseases under the guise of vaccines so that he could watch and study the effects if left untreated, leaving his victims suffering 
horrifying symptoms and eventually letting them die. But that was only the tip of the iceberg. Victims of his evil experiments would also have limbs amputated and reattached to other parts of their bodies, while conscious and without the use of any anesthesia. Or they'd be put into pressure chambers until their eyes literally escaped their skulls. It's estimated that nearly 10,000 people died at the hands of Shiro Ishii's cruel experiments, but perhaps most insane of all is that after the war ended, he was never charged with any war crimes, as he traded the information he obtained in his experiments for immunity and then lived out the remainder of his life in Japan a free man. And last up, we have Harry Harlow. Harry Harlow was an American psychologist during the 30s to the 50s, and although he didn't experiment on people, he is widely regarded as cruel and unethical for his experiments on monkeys. Harlow had one big question. What was the meaning of love? Initially it started as an earnest study looking at the bond between a mother and her offspring, and early on it did actually provide psychologists with some valuable information about the importance of connection in those early years. But Harlow soon became obsessed and began blurring the lines of ethical experimentation until soon he was nothing more than a monster. What was once about discovering the importance of early stage bonding morphed into long term isolation and the mental effects it had on the monkeys. Harlow and his team had what they literally called the pits of despair, I kid you not, where the test subjects would be isolated without any contact, including the smells and sounds of other monkeys for up to a year. The results of his experiment were severely damaged monkeys who as he described were obliterated socially. After being released from isolation, many refused to eat and some ended up dying from starvation. Autopsies would show the monkeys were actively choosing not to eat, causing some to believe that he had actually driven the animals to such bad mental states that they no longer wanted to be alive. Over the years, he got the name monkey torturer as on top of extended isolation, he would also actually force the monkeys to mate using an archaic device. However, because he was conducting such experiments prior to the Animal Welfare Act of 1966, not only did he not face any repercussions, he was actually awarded for his findings and highly celebrated among many in his industry. This doesn't mean he went uncriticized for his unethical treatment. Some of the students that worked in Harlow's unit at the university have come forward saying that they had nightmares of the experiments being conducted and couldn't wait until he retired to shut down the entire operation. Others said that anybody with respect for life would find this offensive, and all he left was one huge mess to clean up. Later Harlow went on to say in a 1974 interview, I don't really like animals. I despise cats. I hate dogs. How could you like a monkey? So despite looking for the meaning of love, it seems he was more interested in torturing innocent monkeys and causing irreversible harm. Number 5. The Monster Study Wow, right into it, huh? Great name for it and all. The Monster Study was a terrifying and triggering speech and stuttering experiment that took place in 1939. Performed on 22 orphans and conducted by Wendell Johnson, the professor of speech and pathology at the University of Iowa. Half of the people received positive speech therapy, praising the fluency of their speech. I just watched King's speech with Colin Firth, and let me tell you, yeah, it's uh, nothing like that, no. That had a happy ending with metaphors and lessons interwoven. This is just science being cruel. Because the other half, the negative speech therapy, which includes belittling the subjects for speech imperfections, yeah, just straight up chirping at people, suffering a lifetime of obvious emotional stress already, and of course, retaining that stress and speech difficulty for the remainder of their life. It was dubbed the monster study as some of Johnson's peers were absolutely pissed and horrified that he would experiment on orphanage subjects at such a tender age in development to confirm his hypothesis. Yeah, sick stuff, dude, really? Basically, good reinforcement meant fast learning. You ever been yelled at by a parent while doing math? Yeah, it's horrible. 
On top of everything, the experiment was kept hidden for fear Johnson's reputation would be tarnished in the wake of human experiments conducted during the war. Uh, you think? The results were actually never published, and his thesis is the only official record of the details. Apparently, the university apologized in 2001, but the university assistant professor of speech pathology said the data collected from the experiment is unfortunately the largest collection of scientific information on stuttering that we have, and that Johnson's work was the first to discuss the importance of the thoughts and beliefs and feelings of the actual individual struggling. Number four, multiple births. The 1960s were a dark time for medicine. Clinical psychiatrist Peter Nobauer and a couple of professors at Yale University thought it'd be a good idea to persuade Louise Wise Services, an adoption agency, to send twins and triplets to completely different homes without telling the adoptive parents and they were adopting a child who was of uh, another sibling. And neither did the biological parents, of course. <laughs> Whoa, what? Yeah, that's not cool. I can see angry mama bears right now just clawing at the screen. Apparently, researchers sponsored by Children's Services secretly compared their research and progress in now what is called the infamous Twins Study. The research was never completed, but what was left behind was the unethical treatment and trauma of separating individuals at birth. That didn't end, apparently, in New York until the 1980s. In 1990, a decade after the confidential study, Nobauer and the Child Development Center of the Jewish Board of Family and Children's Services arranged to actually house the locked records at Yale. University. The Jewish board set terms that gave the organization power to approve or deny any requests to access the records for the next 75 years. In 2018, apparently a couple thousand pages were released to the public, but of course, like all things intending to be silent, the pages were heavily redacted. Yeah, lots of sharpieing. Yo, this is absolutely terrifying, okay? Like, what did they find in that study? Also, so sad. There's been a couple documentaries now covering this study and focusing on the trauma it's caused to those who again begged to gain access to their own files. In 2011, apparently the Jewish board denied two separate twins the request to access their own sealed records. So what exactly happened that made these scientists so secretive of their work? Number three, Stanford Prison. The Stanford Prison Experiment was a psychological experiment conducted in the summer of 1971. Pretty standard university experiment. A two-week simulation of a prison environment that examined the effects of situational variables on participants. Yeah, what could go wrong, right? Well, we just heard how when it comes to university studies, the law all of a sudden becomes this imaginary thing. Stanford University psychology professor Philip Zimbardo led this research study. Participants were recruited from the local ad and a local school newspaper engineered by the research team, offering only male participants 15 bucks per day for those to participate in a fun study looking at prison life. Haha, <laughs> yeehaw. People were handpicked after psych assessments, then randomly assigned roles of either prisoner or guard. Like a giant game of cops and robbers, right? The guards were given uniforms and instructed to prevent prisoners from escaping. No rules. The experiment officially started when prisoners were booked by real Palo Alto police. And over the next five days, psychological abuse by the guards became more and more sadistic. The experiment was actually forced to end on the sixth day. Let's just say it got so violent, it's known as one of the most unethical psychological experiments in history. The harm and abuse inflicted on the participants prompted universities worldwide to improve their own ethics departments, and experiments were then severely reevaluated by the educational board before they began. This was an example of use of power, the barbarism of humans, the sick experimental boundaries those are risking to put others through for career-breaking research. Scary stuff. Number two, Burke and Hare. The Burke and Hare murders were a series of 16 separate targeted murders committed over the span of about 10 months in 1828 in Edinburgh, Scotland. The culprits, you guessed it, William Burke and William Hare. These two were so rotten, they actually dug up and sold corpses to surgeons like Robert Knox for dissection. You see, Edinburgh was the leading city of anatomical study in the 1800s, and all that research demanded a ton of cadavers to experiment on. Due to the rapid shortage of cadavers to do research on, hence the time of medicine, 
Grave digging became a huge issue. Scottish law required that all corpses used for medical research shall only come from deceased prisoners or sick houses. Okay, <laughs> and cue organized crime. This led body snatching to become a huge thing. I mean, easy and plentiful to make a quick buck, right? But to make sure graves were left untouched, mort safes and gates were put up in cemeteries to act as almost like bear traps on top of the graves. Of course, this is where our gentlemen come into this. The men instead decided to go on a rampage taking fresh and very alive victims' bodies right then and there. Yeah, gruesome stuff. Then they would take them on down to the medical center and payday. The police offered Hare immunity from prosecution if he knew anything. Basically, if you snitch, your name's clean. He fessed up the details immediately of the victims and confessed to all 16 deaths with his accomplice. Formal charges were made against Burke and he was hanged to death. His corpse was dissected and his skeleton displayed at the Anatomical Museum of Edinburgh Medical School, where, as of 2022, still remains. Okay, the last part's a little sadistic, no? Also very ironic. Number one, Jose Delgado. Rodriguez Delgado's research was cutting edge for his time. It was centered on the use of electrical signals to invoke responses in the brain. This is like way before Neuralink and scientists were trying to microchip us for like Interac and stuff. It was the early 40s, a dark time for medicine. Famed for his research on mind control through electrical stimulation of the brain. His earliest work was actually with cats, but of course, if you haven't guessed, he later experimented with monkeys and then eventually humans. Specifically, psychiatric patients. Delgado's work was centered around a certain invention he coined the stimoceiver, a radio which joined the stimulator of brainwaves with a receiver. This allowed the subject of an experiment full freedom of movement while allowing the experimenter to control the experimentee. Very sci fi for the time, you know? Basically, the math behind putting a giant antenna in your head, but it's inside your head. The stimoceiver was used to simulate emotions and control the person's behavior. Stimulation on different points in the amygdala in four patients produced a variety of effects including deep concentration, odd feelings, and colorful visions. Okay, no, not so bad so far. Delgado could not only elicit emotions, he could also elicit tons of movement. Yeah, we're talking weekend at Bernie's type movement, but subtle at first, like a limb or the clenching of a fist, then bigger limbs and more movement. Basically, this guy was driving you via your brain. Mad scientist or the pioneer of electric brain stimulation? Mm, maybe you can be both. Number five on this list is the aviator suit. Parachutes took a while to master guys and no one knows that better than Franz Reichelt. Mental Floss says if there's anything to be said for Franz Reichelt, it's that he had some supreme confidence in his own invention. In the early 1900s, Reichelt crafted a parachute from 320 square feet of fabric, all of which folded up into a wearable aviator suit. He had conducted several parachutes shoot tests using dummies which all failed. He pinned the blame on the building saying that they simply weren't tall enough. In 1912, Reichelt planned to test his latest version by flinging a dummy from the Eiffel Tower. But when he arrived at the famous landmark, the inventor surprised the waiting crowd by strapping on the parachute himself and taking the leap. The parachute didn't open and Reichelt became a victim of his own invention. An autopsy reportedly determined that he of a heart attack on the way down. Imagine having the confidence to jump off of the Eiffel Tower using a so-called parachute that has literally never worked before. Number four on this list is the 10 cent beers. All right, so this isn't really a science experiment at all, but it is an experiment of some kind. Mental Floss says in 1974, the Cleveland Guardians tinkered with a new promotion to increase game attendance, giving fans the opportunity to purchase an unlimited amount of beer for 10 cents a cup, which wasn't the best idea. The game against the Texas Rangers was an eventful one. Memorable events of the evening included a woman running into the Guardians on deck circle and flashing the umpire, a fan running onto the field and sliding into second base, and a father and son 
who ran onto the outfield and mooned the bleacher section. Things took a violent turn when fans launched fireworks into the Rangers dugout and the whole thing eventually turned into an all out riot. Fans against players on both teams. Players were hit with folding chairs, there were numerous fist fights and some players were injured when they were pelted with rocks. After that the Cleveland Guardians kept 10 cent beer nights but limited the promotion to two drinks per person. So basically humans and 10 cent beers do not go well in a public setting. I also looked it up with an inflation calculator and even today that would have been 60 cents a beer. Yeah, I can see how that could have been a problem. Number three on this list is the ape experiment. Yeah, you know, I didn't think it would take a rocket scientist to figure out that raising your kid among apes was a bad idea, but here we are. Mental Floss says in the early 1930s, comparative psychologist Winthrop Kellogg and his wife welcomed a healthy baby boy they named Donald. The psychologist had grown interested in those stories of children who were raised feral, but he didn't send Donald to be raised by wolves. He did the opposite. He managed to get his hands on a similar aged baby chimp named Gua and raised her alongside Donald. Gua initially did better than Donald in tests that included things like memory, scribbling, strength, dexterity, reflexes, problem solving, climbing, obviously, language comprehension, and more. But she eventually plateaued and it became evident that no amount of equal treatment was going to make her behave more like a human. But when the Kelloggs ended the experiment, they did so abruptly and without much explanation, which is contrary to the meticulous records they otherwise took throughout the course of the study. While Gua wasn't showing any signs of picking up English, Donald had started to imitate the vocalizations of his sister from another species, so it's not hard to speculate why the Kelloggs called it quits. Guys, I'm all for having a pet, but when my kid starts acting more like the pet than me, that's where we need to call it, I think. Kellogg's felt the same way, and hopefully that will be the last time anyone ever tries something like this. Number two on this list is the soul experiment. So in all honesty, this one is pretty dumb in my opinion, but if it's actually accurate, then this would make for an incredible discovery. Mental Floss says in 1901, Duncan McDougall conducted experiments on extremely recently deceased people and dogs to see if their body weight changed immediately after a decrease in weight, he theorized, would be indicative of a physical soul leaving the body. To test this theory, he weighed six people before and after their death and concluded that there was a weight difference anywhere from half to one and a half ounces. He repeated the experiment on dogs and found no difference and therefore, by McDougall's reasoning, dogs have no souls. Other scientists have been critical of this experiment from day one, citing issues like small sample size and imprecise methods of measurement. Sounds like my dude Duncan was more of a cat person, honestly. I don't know, folks. It feels like there are a lot of holes in this experiment and not a whole lot of logic. Maybe Maybe it is accurate though and we do have souls that weigh something. And finally number one on this list is the Unib- Mental Floss says, it's probably safe to say that an experiment falls into the gone wrong category when it may have been responsible for producing the Unib- as an undergrad at Harvard in the late 1950s and early 60s, Ted Kaczynski participated in a three-year-long study run by Henry A. Murray that explored the effects of stress on the human psyche. After being asked to submit an essay about their worldview and personal philosophies, Kaczynski and 21 other students were interrogated under bright lights, wired to electrodes, and completely torn down for their beliefs. The techniques were intended to break enemy agents during the Cold War and the students were never completely informed about the nature of the study. In short, the man who would eventually kill three people and injure over 20 more with his homemade was subjected to repeated psychological torture. Any experiment that ends up with this happening obviously went very wrong and never should have happened in the first place. People have a limit and it seems like these experiments just pushed people way past them. Obviously this is not an excuse for Ted's behavior in any means, but I'm sure that it was a big factor in making it happen. Number five, Nanulak. Kicking this list off, we have a beast more terrifying than literally any other creature on this planet right now. Apparently this thing is real. Yeah. The apex predator. 
The top of the food chain, twice interbred. This thing is a killing machine. The grizzly polar bear hybrid, aka the growler bear or the pizzly bear. Great names, great names. What do you like? I like the pizzly bear myself. It's the least aggressive. These two aggressive bears make up this rare hybrid that has occurred both in captivity and in the wild. So not only did they try this one in a lab, safe with test tubes, in nature this thing just evolved by itself and is just trucking around hunting as we speak. Yeah, that's horrifying. In 2006, the hybrid was confirmed by testing the DNA of a unique looking bear shot in the Northwest Territories on Banks Island in the Canadian Arctic. A hunter from Idaho reportedly shot a grizzly polar bear hybrid near Saks Harbor in April with his local guide. They had been hunting for polar bears and killed the animal believing it to be a normal find. Officials took interest in the creature after noticing that while it had thick white fur, it also had long razor sharp claws, a humped back, a shallow face, brown patches on its body, and was almost twice the size, which are all traits of grizzly bears. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeehaw! DNA tests conducted by Wildlife Genetics International in British Columbia confirmed it was a hybrid with polar bear as a mother and a grizzly bear as a father. Yeah. Netflix can't be horror, here we come. The number of confirmed hybrids has now risen to eight, all of them being children from the same female hybrid polar grizzly bear mother. There's only a couple of them. Yeah, thank God. Since the 2006 discovery, the hybrid has been referred to by several names, including Pizzly Bear and the Growler Bear, but Canadian wildlife officials have suggested calling the hybrid bear Nanolac, taken from the Inuit names for Polar Bear and Grizzly Bear. Yeah, that's a sick name. That's a way better name. Let's go with that name, 100%. Number four, the Kulakamba. The Kulakamba or Kulukamba is an apparent hybrid species of chimpanzee and gorilla hybrid found and reported in Africa in the early 19th century. Although no empirical evidence has been found to substantiate the existence of the creature more than once, the Kulakamba has been referenced in numerous times in some mid 19th century work and in some descriptive work from around 1860 to 1899 titled Explorations and Adventures in Equatorial Africa. The explorers refer to this unique ape hybrid as the Kulakamba based upon the description of words used by the First Nations people in the Ovenga River of West Africa. The people allegedly refer to the ape as Kulu because of its unique vocalization, unlike the sounds and abilities of other apes. Kamba is a word meaning quote, to speak. Okay, that's terrifying. The local people upon finding this hybrid creature were saying that its name came from its ability to make sounds and talk unlike any other species. The Kulakamba is believed to be much larger with a flattened face, longer, larger skull, but more bipedal than a chimpanzee, meaning it walked on its legs much more like us. Although there has not been a documented sighting of the Kulakamba since 1881, in 1996, a picture of an unusual looking ape was taken by Peter Jenkins and Liza Gadsby at the Cameroon Zoo, showing a seemingly hybrid ape that fit all the descriptions of the Kulakamba, being supposedly that of a chimpanzee and gorilla hybrid. Could this be like a new form of sapien roaming our planet? Is this thing Bigfoot that the FBI is talking about? I don't know, what do you think? Number three, pythons. In the 1980s, a small number of pet Burmese pythons were released into Florida wildlife. Couple here, couple there, nothing crazy. Since then, these slithering snakes have started to wreak absolute havoc on wildlife and communities and have become something of a weird science project. A number of Burmese pythons running loose in the state of Florida are now officially a hybrid species, which could make them even more evolved than their other snake relatives. Scientists from the United States Geological Survey of the Everglades National Park analyzed skin and cell tissues from around 400 Burmese pythons that were captured in Florida between 2001 and 2012. The team wanted to learn more about the invasive species in order to better understand Florida's threat of the overgrowing population posed by wildlife and locals. Sure. The researchers expected to find only the pure genetic makeup of the Burmese python, coined the American alligator killer. It's quite the reputation. But according to the study, the number of interbred snakes with somewhat of a new genetic makeup started becoming more worrisome the more that they found. When two species come together, they have a unique set of generic traits and characteristics that they use for survival. This is made up of the environment around them. Indian rock pythons are smaller but much faster. Burmese pythons thrive in jungles and grassy marshes and are much, much bigger. Together, mixed with a little swap and spit, is this demon serpent. Yeah, the new and improved Floridian Jungle Croc Annihilator. Again, Q campy Netflix movie, Croc Killer 5. 
I don't know, or something like that. When researchers involved in the new study analyzed samples found in Florida, they discovered that some animals assumed to be purebred pythons were also carrying new DNA, making a new rock python. Yeah, that's awesome. A couple of guys let their pets out, and now there's snakes with double the abilities running around. Or slithering around, just by accident. This guy just rushed like a million years of evolution. Yeah. Thanks, Florida. Number two, Beetlejuice. A living beetle computer hybrid with legs that can be fully controlled by humans has been created by researchers in Singapore. I feel like that should have been on every newspaper in like 2016. Like, did you hear about this? Cause like I never did, you know? The beetle joins a long list of insects that have been turned into robots since the early 2000s. The others, of course, including hawk moths and cockroaches. None of those insects, however, had their walking speed, step frequency, and gait fully controlled by humans, making the beetle bot the first of its kind. Okay, this thing is terrifying. I've seen what Sophia does with the AI that is capable over at Hanson Robotics. This thing's gonna be the next bug terminator. Like, I feel like this is the prequel to Starship Troopers. Researchers apparently ran electrodes into the leg muscles in the beetle's first pair of legs, and then stimulated movement by running currents through each other specific leg, Dr. Octavius style. The giant flower beetle, or Messi Norina Torcata, was then controlled via wires mounted onto the insect by Dr. Hirotika Sato, an aerospace engineer, and his team from Nayang Technology University in Singapore, tracking the beetle's motion with a 3D motion capturing system. They were then able to make the beetle gallop and walk alternating legs. First off, this is a little cruel, but also pretty cool. I didn't even know that bugs had muscles in their legs. The hybrid might prove a useful step towards building robots for use in disaster zones, where they could be equipped with cameras or microphones and navigated through tiny cracks to search for humans trapped under rubble. Okay, I like this thing all of a sudden again. Yeah, this is good. This is good news. Blending technology with the animal kingdom. Ant-Man and Wasp style. I like it. Due to the beetle still being alive, of course, humans would be able to switch from controlling the beetle to letting it navigate on its own way. When the insect computer hybrid robot encounters an obstacle, the user can simply switch off the controller, allowing the neural control networks of the robot to overcome the obstacle. In doing so, the researchers can manipulate the different walking speeds, patterns, flying directions, and all other forms of the motion. Basically, it's playing PlayStation with a bug. And number one, killer bees. Speaking of more creepy crawlies, we have these nasty things. The African honeybee, AKA killer bee, is a hybrid produced originally by crossbreeding the East African honeybee with various of the European bees. First introduced in Brazil in 1956, 26 swarms escaped quarantine, and since then, this aggressive hybrid has spread throughout South America and North America by 1991. Yeah, that means before Pearl Jam was really going, there wasn't too many of these flying around. Once in a blue moon kind of deal. But time flies. Typically much more defensive than any other honeybee, these killer bees react faster and can chase a person a quarter of a mile. They kill about a thousand people each year and even kill cows and horses. Although there are 29 recognized subspecies of bee, this seems to be the most aggressive. Biochemists have tracked down the brain chemicals that make killer bees so ferocious. It's the compounds which seem to be present in higher levels in the much feared Africanized honeybee, which makes less aggressive bees turn more fierce. That means that it can turn other insects into a more aggressive version of themselves. Honeybees are incredibly territorial, fighting to the death to defend their hive with multiple painful stings, but killer bees, the even crazier hybrids of the relatively docile strain, are more aggressive. Yeah, way more aggressive. Apparently these things are also really, really smart. Like, fish and bees are now able to communicate to each other. Do you know that? In a recent experiment done in Austria in 2019, using a robot translator, engineers from Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and four other universities are able to make the species able to transmit signals back and forth to each other, subsequently resulting in them demonstrating coordinated decisions. Yeah, Google it. Apparently these bees are so smart, they can signal underwater to fish. Yeah, we might not even need the controller for the bugs soon enough. Just when I thought the animal kingdom couldn't get even scarier, bees and fish are texting each other. Yeah. Coming in at number five, we have chainsaw. Do you know why the chainsaw was invented? If you don't, then this might surprise you. Surprisingly, the chainsaw was not invented for cutting down trees or any type of manual work. It was actually invented to help with childbirth. And by help, it was more of an unnecessary torture, making a painful experience much, much worse. Two Scottish doctors, John Aitken and James Jeffrey, invented the tool in the 1780s. Before the cesarean section was common practice, all babies had to pass through the birth canal. When the 
baby became stuck or breached, the doctor would remove the parts of the pelvis bone. This was medically known as symphysiotomy. This was a painful and messy procedure that was performed without any anesthesia. The doctors complained that the procedure took a long time as they had to remove the bone by hand. They invented a small chainsaw to make the procedure faster for them to perform, but still incredibly painful. For women, the procedure had a high risk of infection, injury, and even long term walking difficulty. It could ruin their lives as well as the high risks already associated with childbirth from that time. In the 20th century, the use of this procedure became obsolete when improvements in hygiene and technique made the caesarean section much safer. It wasn't until the 1920s that the chainsaw began to be developed for use in forestry work. Coming in at number four, we have the Stanford Prison Experiment. The Stanford Prison Experiment is a famous experiment conducted in 1971. There have been documentaries and even a film created based on the story of what happened to the participants. Dr. Zimbardo wanted to create a social experiment to see how people would react when put into certain roles. Would they behave as their usual self or mold to their new role? The two week experiment took place in a prison environment. It soon became controversial when the public saw the details and heard from those involved. Some questioned the scientific validity and called the methods deeply flawed. Once approved by the university, they placed an ad for male college students to participate in a psychological study. 75 applied for the study and after screening, 24 were accepted. The applicants were predominantly white middle class and appeared to be psychologically healthy and stable. They chose people without a criminal background or any medical problems. They were then randomly separated into two groups, one being inmates and the others guards. They were paid $100 a day to participate for 14 days. Within as little as 5 days the group had fallen into chaos. The guards took on the stereotypes of what a prison guard should be in their eyes. They all became cruel and made choices to impact the prisoners such as limit their food, or make them wear bags on their head. They allowed a visit from family on the fifth day. Parents were concerned about the well-being of their children and threatened to contact lawyers to get them removed from the experiment. A colleague of Dr. Zimbardo visited the experiment the same day and was disgusted by the behaviour she witnessed. She also noted that the doctor had also seen behaviour changes in his role as the warden. She said she didn't recognise him, he was acting so out of character. Due to her findings, the parents' outrage and the increasing brutality, the experiment was cancelled just six days in. The doctor went on to publish his views on the study, how the power of authority can change people's personality, or the situation you're in can make you do horrible things you never would have before. Some of the participants have spoken out about the study, explaining how it made them feel at the time. Luckily none of them mentioned long lasting psychological effects. Coming in at number 3 we have Guatemala Syphilis Experiments. The Guatemala Syphilis Experiments were United States led human experiments conducted from 1946 to 1948. Although I'm sure the effects the effects of this experiment lasted far past that. The experiments were led by a doctor named Charles Cutler. The idea for the study was to infect soldiers, prisoners and mentally ill patients with syphilis and other sexually transmitted diseases. The worst part about this was that none of the participants were aware that they were even part of the study. The United States wanted to see the effects that the disease would have on their participants over a long period of time. There were at least 30 documented deaths due to the experiment but that number could be much higher. These diseases can cause infertility blindness, it can make you paralyzed and even cause dementia. There is a long list of horrible things that were inflicted on these people that would have affected them and future generations for years following. The experiments were uncovered in 2005 while someone was researching into studies around it. It wasn't until 2010 when the US government formally apologized for their actions. They admitted to violating human rights and that committing the study was a crime against humanity. There have since been a number of lawsuits filed against the US government for what they did to the community. People want answers as to why and how this could have happened. What makes this worse is that this was not the first study of its kind conducted by the US public health study. They did the exact same thing in 1932 to Tuskegee. 600 sharecroppers were found and hired in Alabama. Again, none of them were told they had been given the disease. They were only told they'd be given free healthcare, meals and burial insurance. Even after penicillin was proven to cure the disease, the study continued until 1972, 25 years after the cure was found. In addition to the original subjects, the victims of the trial passed the disease onto their wives and their children were born with it also. They tried to cover up both trials but Bill Clinton formally apologised in 1997 to those affected after it had been uncovered. Coming in at number 2 we have experimentation in the Soviet Union. In 1921 the Soviet Union started to do human experimentation. They built two laboratories for experiments with poison called Laboratory 1, Laboratory 12 and Chimera. They wanted these studies to be covert so that they would be able to use it against their enemies. They would take 
prisoners from the forced labour camps called the Gulag and bring them to the facilities. While there they would give them a meal, it would be poisoned but they would not be told this. They would first see if they noticed the smell or taste of the poison and then they would examine the body to see if there were any trace of it in their system. Their goal was to find the perfect poison, one that didn't have a smell or taste and that could not be detected post mortem. Over the time of the experiments they tested poisons including mustard gas, ricin, digitoxin and cura. They continued their experiments for most of the 21st century. And finally in at number 1 we have testing on American military. During World War 2 scientists who were funded by the US government conducted experiments using American navy soldiers. They were given the green light to prepare for the use of chemical warfare, something that was used frequently in World War 1. There were at least 9 research projects dedicated to this study. They wanted to test the effectiveness of a new type of clothing and gas mask against the deadly gas. 17 and 18 year olds were approached after they had completed boot camp. They were only asked if they would participate in a study that would shorten the length of the war. They were not told what they would be doing. Only once the boys reached the research facility were they told that it involved mustard gas. Almost all of the participants suffered from severe external and internal burns. Once they left the facility they were ignored by the navy. In some cases they were threatened by the espionage act. They were told that they would be punished if they were to tell anyone about the study that they were involved in. Under the espionage act anyone sharing information about the war effects were considered a criminal. So if the enemies learned of these experiments they would lose their upper hand if they had one. In 1991 the reports of what happened were finally declassified and were taken before Congress. There were 60,000 US soldiers who took part in the trial. Number 5 on this list is the Human Z. The Human Z, as you can imagine, is a human mixed with a chimpanzee. This is a very interesting entry on this list because whether or not it has actually been created or not is up for debate. Science Alert says a prominent US scientist has claimed researchers in Florida succeeded in breeding a human human chimp hybrid called a human Z in controversial long rumored 1920s research. Evolutionary psychologist Gordon G. Gallup Jr. who achieved renown for his pioneering mirror self recognition experiments with animals in the 1970s says a former university professor told him the hybrid creature was born at an animal research laboratory where he once worked. One of the most interesting cases involved an attempt which was made back in the 1920s in what was the first primate research center established in the US in Orange Park, Florida. Gallup told the Sun. They inseminated a female chimpanzee with human semen from an undisclosed donor and claimed not only that pregnancy occurred but the pregnancy went full term and resulted in a live birth. There's little reason to think such an experiment successfully took place and plenty of reasons to believe it didn't. But having an otherwise respected researcher make such a statement is drawing attention to this old rumor once again. It's definitely interesting to see a highly respected scientist in the community come out and make these claims like this. That does tend to carry a decent amount of weight and at the very least deserves to be investigated a little bit. It was also rumored that a few years ago some people came forward requesting government approval to do an experiment like this but it was denied. Denied. So there's definitely been rumblings about an experiment like this before, but no definitive proof that it's actually taken place. To be completely honest, I do believe that something like this has went down. I just think that it may have happened behind closed doors, and we may not be privy to it. Like this totally seems like something that the government could be interested in, but wouldn't want the public to find out about. Maybe in some secret base in some very low population part of the world, there is a human Z running around getting experimented on. Number 4 on this list is the human pig. So as we are going to see from this one, there are a lot of possible benefits from this, but also a ton of moral and ethical questions that pop up. Pagista says the first human pig hybrid embryo has been created in the lab and it represents a major step forward in the field of regenerative medicine. This news comes from a team of researchers at the Salk Institute who were able to successfully grow human cells inside of a pig embryo for the first time ever. While this may sound like something out of a science fiction novel, the potential implications are actually quite significant. This achievement could one day 
day lead to the creation of transplant organs for humans that are made from animal tissue. This would be an incredible breakthrough for those suffering from organ failure as there would no longer need to be a wait for a human donor. Of course, there is still a long way to go before this technology is ready for clinical use. The next step will be to see if these hybrid embryos can develop into healthy adults. But even if that proves to be possible, it will be many years before we see anything like this being used in patients. So here is the thing with this. Yes, it would be awesome to be able to have a steady supply of usable organs to give to people who are suffering or need another one. So many people die from not having enough transplantable organs and this is a problem that needs to be addressed. However, this also raises the question, what about the human pigs? These are going to be half human creatures that are going to be bred for the specific purpose of having their organs harvested. This is clearly a very polarizing issue and something that people a lot smarter Harder than me, they need to look into. Comment down below what you think about this potential innovation and how you think we should proceed. Number three on this list is the Jag Lion. Now, in all honesty, this is more cool than it is terrifying, but I still wanted to include at least one relatively cool thing on the list. Also, too, if you did run into this thing in the wild, then I can promise you it would be very scary. So, I think it still qualifies. Pajusta says, a jag lion hybrid is a cross between a male jaguar and a female lion. The result is an animal with characteristics of both parent species, although it's usually more similar to the lion in appearance. Jag lions are not currently found in the wild, but several have been born in captivity. The jag lion was first created in 2006 when a male jaguar named Elvis was bred with a female lion named Lola at the exceptional animal park located in Phoenix, Arizona, USA. The two big cats mated successfully and Lola gave birth to six healthy jag lion cubs. Since then, several other jag lions have been born in zoos around the world. These hybrids are not only interesting to look at, they also help scientists to learn more about the genetics of both lions and jaguars. So, like I said, this thing is really cool, but could also be very scary depending on where and how you run into it. In the zoo, where there's a large protective piece of glass between the two of you, not very scary at all, totally cool. In the jungle, where there is no protective glass and this creature is very hungry, not cool, very scary. Good thing that there really isn't any of these creatures at the wild at the moment, so running into one outside of captivity would be very, very hard, but... You never know. Number two on this list is the Wolfen. Breeding one of the most intelligent creatures with one of the deadliest. Sounds like a great idea. That's what happened here with the Wolfen. Pagistus says, weird hybrid experiments usually make for interesting reading and the Wolfen is no different. This unusual creature is actually a cross between a false killer whale and an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin and was first discovered back in 1985. Since then, there have been several documented cases of Wolfens in the wild and even a few captive ones as well. While they share many characteristics with both of their parent species, there are some notable differences that make the wolfen truly unique. For one, they are typically smaller than either false killer whales or bottlenose dolphins with an average length of just over six feet. They also have a more slender build and their flippers are shorter in proportion to their body than either parent species. Interestingly, wolfens also seem to exhibit social behaviors that are more similar to dolphins than whales. They are often seen forming close bonds with other members of their pod and engaging in activities such as surfing and playfully chasing each other. Each other around. It would be very rare to spot this creature in the wild, but be very careful if you do. Dolphins are super smart and killer whales, well, they're killers. This is one of the most intelligent and also deadliest animals in the ocean and therefore you need to tread carefully around it. And finally number one on this list is the human mouse. The human mouse is another one of those ones with potential positives, but also lots of ethical questions. Pachista says, in a first of its kind study, scientists have created a mouse embryo that contains human cells. The research published in the journal Nature could eventually lead to the development of new treatments for diseases using stem cells. To create the hybrid embryo, the researchers injected human stem cells into a mouse embryo. The human cells then began to grow and form 
form structures that are found in the human brain and heart. The researchers say that the human cells were able to survive and grow because they were surrounded by mouse cells. This suggests that it may be possible to create hybrid embryos that contain a mix of human and animal cells. The study is still in its early stages and it remains to be seen whether these hybrid embryos will be able to develop into healthy animals. However, the findings suggest that it may be one day possible to use stem cells from patients with diseases to create customized treatments. So yeah, again, tons of possible benefits for people who are going through some rough treatments right now, but also we're gonna have a mouse that's almost as smart as us humans acting as a test dummy for us. This is uncharted territory for humans and understanding exactly how to go about it it's something that we're gonna to need to discover along the way. Number five on this list is the human mouse. Now, how the heck did they manage this one? Popular Mechanics says, scientists at the University at Buffalo and the Roswell Park Cancer Institute have bred a new form of human mouse chimera with the highest incidence of human cells ever recorded. Two weeks after the researchers injected human stem cells into the developing mouse embryos, one of the newborn mice exhibited four 4% human cells, a major advance considering human and animal cells don't typically jive well. While they're still mostly just mice and only a tad bit human, the breakthrough marks a step toward more advanced genetically modified embryos in the future. It's not been possible to generate any human stem cells that substantially contribute to mouse embryos, the scientists say in the paper's abstract. Their work may enable applications such as human organ generation in animals. They go on in that article to get very technical with things and break down exactly how they did it, but in all honesty, it got very confusing very quickly to somebody without a science background. The big takeaway here is that there is a mouse out there that is actually 4% human. That mouse, to my knowledge, would be the closest thing in the universe right now to a human being without it being an actual human being. Like, think about that. There is a mouse out there that is kind of like our long lost cousin. This, like, everything on this list starts to get very ethically and morally questionable. At what percent of human does this mouse start to become untouchable? Like at what point do our laws, rights, and freedoms start to apply to the mouse? 20% human? 30% human? 50%? When does this mouse stop being a mouse and start being a human and start getting treated like a human? And also, what the heck would a 50% mouse and 50% human even look like? Like, we're getting into some seriously weird territory here, and as much as I get that this could be good for science or whatever, I'm pretty sure I can go the rest of my life without ever having to see a half-mouse, half-human thing. Ugh. Number four on this list is the human rabbit. You know, if I had to become a human hybrid of any animal, I feel like a rabbit would be cool. At least then I could jump really high and maybe I could finally dunk. The Washington Post says, scientists in China have, for the first time, used cloning techniques to create hybrid embryos that contain a mix of DNA from both humans and rabbits, according to a report in a scientific journal that has reignited the smoldering ethics debate over cloning research. More than 100 of the hybrids made by fusing human skin cells with rabbit eggs were allowed to develop in laboratory dishes for several days before the scientists destroyed them to retrieve so-called embryonic stem cells from their interiors. Although scientists in Massachusetts had previously mixed human cells and cow eggs in a similar attempt to make hybrid embryos as a source of stem cells, those experiments were not successful. Researchers said yesterday they were hopeful that the rabbit were would lead to a new and plentiful source of embryonic stem cells for research and eventually for medical use. But theologians and others decried the work as unethical. Unethical seems to be the theme of this video, folks. That article by the Washington Post was actually written back in 2003. That's right, guys, this happened almost two decades ago, meaning that there has been tons of time for them to make better hybrids behind closed doors. Now, I'm not saying that they continued with these projects, but I'm also not saying that they 
didn't continue either. There was a lot of backlash when this first came out, so continuing with this without people knowing, that might have been desired. Who knows, there could be a fully grown rabbit man hopping around somewhere in some Chinese lab for all we know. Number three on this list is the human pig. This is a thing guys, I really can't believe it is, but this is a literal thing. Stat News says pig embryos that had been injected with human stem cells when they were only a few days old began to grow organs containing human cells, scientists reported on Thursday, an advance that promises or threatens to bring closer the routine production of creatures that are part human and part something else. These human pig chimeras were not allowed to develop past the fetal stage, but the experiment suggests such creations could eventually be used to grow fully human organs for transplant, easing the fatal shortage of organs. 120,000 people in the United States are waiting for life-saving transplants, but every day two dozen die before they get them. Human pig chimeras could also be used for research into prenatal development and to test experimental drugs. A human lung in a pig might show more accurately the effect of a compound intended to treat, say, cystic fibrosis than today's lab animals. So they weren't allowed to grow past the fetal stage, but it is coming, guys. All of these human whatever hybrids have been happening in the last couple of years. They're very recent developments, and considering they've shown promise in the early stages, you can bet that this will just continue to keep going and going. I would not be surprised if within five or 10 years or so, there's some weird, disgusting looking pig human thing oinking itself around the human hybrid barn. Number two on this list, is the human monkey. I know that we technically descended from monkeys, but now it looks like we're taking that to a whole other level. Nature.com says, scientists have successfully grown monkey embryos containing human cells for the first time, the latest milestone in a rapidly advancing field that has drawn ethical questions. In the work published on the 15th of April in Cell One, the team injected monkey embryos with human stem cells and watched them develop. They observed human Human and monkey cells divide and grow together in a dish with at least three embryos surviving to 19 days after fertilization. The overall message is that every embryo contained human cells that proliferate and differentiate to a different extent, says Juan Carlos, a developmental biologist at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies at La Jolla, California, and one of the researchers who led the work. Researchers hope that some human-animal hybrids known as chimeras could provide better models in which to test drugs and be used to grow human organs for transplants. Members of this research team were the first to show in 2019 that they could grow monkey embryos in a dish for up to 20 days after fertilization. So they are literally making these human monkey things and gonna use them as a place to test drugs and other things. No wonder this is bringing up some ethical debates. A half human is going to be bred to get stuff tested on it and then have its organs harvested. Remind me to not get reincarnated as a human monkey please. Now I should note that this is a long way from being finalized and we are looking at many, many years until we have human monkeys walking around or being tested upon. But still, it is happening and they are already finding ways to make it work. Comment down below your feelings on this and whether you think that what they're planning to do is morally right or not. And finally, number one on this list is mouse human. So we had human mouse, and this is what I'm calling mouse human. Basically, it's the exact same idea as before, except this time, instead of nondescript human stem cells, they decided to go with human brain cells. Basically, what they've done here is take a mouse and inject some human brain cells into the mouse. This implant has actually shown to make the mice more intelligent than they were before. When referring to what it does to a mouse, Mouse's brain, one scientist said it's like ramping up the power of your computer. So there guys, it's just like adding a bit more juice to your laptop. Nothing wrong with this picture, nothing to see here. Yeah, all right, Mr. Science Guy. Obviously, as you can all expect by this point, moral and ethical questions have come up about this practice and whether or not it should continue. I think what I wanna know is, where are the human brain cells coming from? Are people like donating their brain cells or how does this work? All I know is that I need to hold on to the ones that I currently have and won't be donating any of my intelligence to a mouse anytime soon. Number five on this list is the aviator suit. Back in the early 1900s, flight was on everyone's mind. 
Flying machines were extremely new and were not very well developed, but scientists wanted to push it further. In this case, the specific scientist in question is Franz Reichelt. Franz Reichelt was designing an aviator suit. This aviator suit is just a fancy name for what we now consider to be a parachute. He folded up a fabric that was roughly 320 square feet and made it into a wearable aviator suit. The idea was exactly what we have now for a parachute. You jump into the air from a high height and then your parachute comes out and you should gently float to the ground. This is great in theory, but it didn't work out that great in practice. Franz had tried his device from the roof of a few buildings, but it never worked. He claimed that it wasn't his invention that was the problem, but the height of the building. So, naturally, we just needed to try it from a higher building. Enter in the Eiffel Tower. Now, up until this point, he was using test dummies to jump off the buildings, and he was all set to do that again for the Eiffel Tower, but last minute, he got a change of heart. Franz was feeling that performance adrenaline and wanted to show off his invention to the crowd below, so he strapped into his suit and leaped off the Eiffel Tower himself. He beautifully floated down to the ground in a picturesque fashion to the sound of crowds cheering and chanting his name is what he wanted to happen. What actually happened is that he jumped off, the suit didn't work, and he fell all the way to the ground from the Eiffel Tower. Believe it or not, the landing didn't actually kill him though. He was already dead. Franz had a heart attack before he hit the ground when he realized his suit wasn't gonna work. Number four on this list is Australia's mustard gas experiment. One would think that testing a deadly poisonous gas on people would be kind of a silly and dangerous thing to do, but that's exactly what happened in this science experiment. Top 10's writes, Queensland, Australia set the stage for some awful chemical weapons testing on human subjects. The year 1942 brought Australia into the thick of World War II. Hostilities when Japanese aggression brought more questions than answers about how mustard gas might behave and deliver harm in a tropical climate. The chemical weapon had already been deployed against China by Japan, sparking fears that Australia was next in line. To investigate human experiments using a gas chamber which was moved from Townsville, Australia to Melbourne on a three-ton truck were conducted. The trouble is the danger of mustard gas exposure was underestimated. Over the three years to follow, a range of secret tests were done. The research included gas chamber tests involving volunteers who were Australian Armed Forces recruits who apparently did not fully understand the degree of potential harm to which they were getting themselves into. The tropical conditions quadrupled the effects of mustard gas, leaving many with nasty injuries. At Innisfall, volunteers tested how long they could carry on their duties while exposed to burning mustard gas, while 1944 experiments on Northbrook Island saw volunteers dropping into trenches after the island was doused with the deadly substance. Imagine literally joining the army to help your country fight, and then your own country, who you've decided to risk your life for, uses you as a test dummy with mustard gas. These were new recruits who had no idea what was going on, but were just trying to help their country, and then BAM! Australia drops a bunch of mustard gas on them and wonders why a lot of them got permanently injured. This one was one of two things. It was either pure stupidity from the Australian government, or it was pure cruelty. Both are bad considering these are the people who run the country making these decisions. Either way, as you can all imagine, the experiment proved that mustard gas is still very dangerous. Number three on this list is Frankenstein. All right, so I know, I know, Frankenstein is a fictional experiment and everything else on this list actually happened, but when it comes to science experiments going wrong, Frankenstein has kind of definitely set the mark here. Frankenstein is the classic novel written by Mary Shelley back in 1818, where a young scientist named Victor Frankenstein decides to organize a science experiment that goes horribly wrong. Well, initially, the experiment actually goes horribly right. We all know the classic line, it's alive, because the experiment did actually work and the monster did actually come alive. There have been multiple adaptations of this story over the years, with some stories talking about how this monster attacked the village below and incited a mob, but in the original story, the monster actually strangled Victor's future wife. Attacking a village, strangling Victor's lover, 
neither of these outcomes are good, so ultimately I think it's safe to say that this experiment didn't go as planned. Number two on this list is the Stanford Prison Experiment. This was a psychological science experiment that is often considered one of the worst in history. The study was done in 1971 and was meant to be a two-week simulation of prison. It was run by Stanford professor Philip Zimbardo and went horribly wrong. Wikipedia says participants were recruited from the local community with an ad in the newspapers offering $15 per day to male students who wanted to participate in a psychological study of prison in life. Volunteers were chosen after assessments of psychological stability and then randomly assigned to being prisoners or prison guards. Critics have questioned the validity of these methods. Those volunteers selected to be guards were given uniforms specifically to de-individuate them and instructed to prevent prisoners from escaping. The experiment officially started when prisoners were arrested by real Palo Alto police. Over the following five days, psychological abuse on the prisoners by the guards became increasingly brutal. After Christina Maslach visited to evaluate the conditions, she was so upset to see how study participants were behaving that she confronted Zimbardo. He ended the experiment on the sixth day. Like the Milgram experiment, SPE has been referenced and critiqued as one of the most unethical psychology experiments in history. The harm inflicted on the participants prompted universities worldwide to improve their ethics requirements for human subject experiments. Other researchers have found it difficult to reproduce reduce the study, especially given those constraints. It truly was extremely brutal, and the fact that it went on for as long as it did is kind of crazy. Many of the people that participated here had long-lasting effects, and this incident changed their lives forever. All for $15 a day just so this sick professor could see that prison ultimately really sucks. And finally, number one on this list is Unit 731. Unit 731 was absolutely terrifying and not a group that you wanted to be associated with at all. Basically, this was a group that conducted multiple science experiments on civilians. They were around from the 1930s to the 1940s in the Japanese army. They were led by General Shiro Ishii and were responsible for killing potentially over 200,000 people. These deaths were sometimes purposeful, but mainly they were just a byproduct of the horrible experiments that they were performing. Live Science says numerous diseases were studied in order to determine their potential use in warfare. Among them were plague, anthrax, dysentery, typhoid, paratyphoid, and chlorora, according to a paper by Dr. Robert K.D. Peterson from Montana University. Numerous atrocities were committed, including infecting wells with cholera and typhoid and spreading plague-ridden fleas across Chinese cities. According to Peterson, the fleas were dropped in clay bombs, which were dropped at a height of 200 to 300 meters and showed no trace. Prisoners were marched in freezing weather and then experimented on to determine the best treatment for frostbite. Former members of the unit have told media outlets that prisoners were doused with poison gas, put in pressure chambers until their eyes popped out, and even dissected while alive and conscious. After the war, the US government helped keep the experiment secret as part of a plan to make Japan a Cold War ally, according to the Times report. They were terrible experiments that often failed and resulted in the loss of human life. These experiments were honestly doomed from the beginning and were destined to go horribly wrong. Starting us off in at number 5, the Stanford Prison Experiment. This one is probably one of the more tame yet still unsettling stories on our list. The Stanford Prison Experiment is one of the most notorious social psychology experiments to occur in the United States. In 1971, a research group at Stanford University, led by Professor Philip Zimbardo, used volunteering college students to conduct an experiment on the psychological effects of perceived power. It was even funded by the US Office of Naval Research. The 24 male students who participated were assigned to one of two groups, the prisoners or the guards, and placed within a mock prison in which Professor Zimbardo acted as the superintendent. Prisoners were arrested at their homes and brought to the mock prison that was beneath the university. Lasting a total of six days before being shut down for using unethical practices, students quickly quickly embraced the roles, with guards using extreme authoritarian tactics that inflicted severe psychological torture to the prisoners, many of which who accepted the abuse. Some of the prisoners reportedly went crazy. There was a solitary confinement area that was a dark closet that prisoners were left within, and many of the guards exhibited genuine sadistic behavior. There's even been a few film adaptations of the story to emerge over the years, including the 2015 movie The Stanford Prison Experiment, starring Ezra Miller and Ty Sheridan. Moving on to 
and number 4 the mustard gas experiments. During World War I, one of the most startling innovations was the gas that German soldiers had released on the Allies. It was a new kind of chemical warfare that was unprecedented, and the Allied forces were unprepared for it. Eventually, masks were developed and improved upon to help soldiers survive the gas bombings. Flash forward to 1943. Mustard gas was anticipated as being a major problem during the Second World War, and the US Navy began testing the effectiveness of new clothing and gas masks that were meant to protect their men from its threat. But these experiments that they did were pretty unethical. Young men who were aged 17 to 18 were brought in after boot camp as participants in an experiment that they were told was to help shorten the war. When they actually arrived at the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, they found out that it had to do with mustard gas, and that they were going to be exposed to it, many of which later then suffered internal and external burns. After the experiments were done, the Navy pretty much ignored what had happened, and even threatened some of these men with the Espionage Act. During the experiments themselves, if the men protested, they were threatened with an immediate court martial, and 40 years in prison. In the files about the experiments were declassified and taken to Congress. The worst part was, the experiments were pretty much for nothing. The Allies only used mustard gas once in World War II, and it was by accident, resulting in over a thousand civilian casualties. Step in number two, Unit 731. Unit 731 was a covert biological and chemical warfare research and development unit of the Imperial Japanese armies during World War II. The unit participated in lethal human experimentation and operated under the official name, the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department of the Kwantung Army. Approximately 3,000 men, women, and children who were war prisoners were experimented on, being euphemistically referred to as logs, with the experiments ranging from vivisection, which is surgery conducted on living organism, that involved injecting prisoners with various diseases and removing organs, germ warfare attacks, frostbite testing, syphilis testing forced pregnancy experiments and weapon testing. Most of the prisoners were Chinese, but prisoners also consisted of European, Soviet, American, Korean, and Australian prisoners of war. 